From Advisory Board, we're bringing you a radio advisory. My name is Rachel Woods. You can call me Ray. Here at Advisory Board, we are committed to changing the business of healthcare for the better. And I said it from day one that radio advisory would be a place to talk about the issues keeping healthcare leaders up at night. Today, I want to dive into an issue that is certainly keeping me up at night, and that's racial injustice and health inequity. And specifically, I'm talking about the nationwide protests that have been sparked after the murder of George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, and Breonna Taylor. Frustration about inequity and injustice is boiling over in so many communities right now. So today, I want to talk about the impact of racism on public health and what you as healthcare leaders can actually do about it. This may not be an easy conversation to have, but it's necessary to make lasting change. So I've brought the leader of workforce and HR research, Michelle Simmons, and health equity researcher, Darby Sullivan, to have that conversation with me. Hey, Michelle. Hey, Darby. Hey. Hi. Michelle, where are you dialing in from? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Michelle, dialing in from Pentagon City in Virginia. And Darby, how about you? Hi, this is Darby. I am calling in from Bloomingdale in Washington, D.C., where there are helicopters circling overhead as another protest is forming a few blocks away. Before we dive in, I just want to address something from the outset. We all know that Advisory Board provides practices and support to healthcare organizations and is a nonpartisan institution. But here's the thing. Racism isn't a political issue, nor is racism something that we should be silent on, as divisive as it might be for some people. And that's exactly why we want to start the conversation right here on Radio Advisory. So let me start with you, Michelle. I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about why racism is an issue that healthcare leaders in particular should be focused on. Racism has and continues to be a public health issue in this country, whether or not we want to name it as such. I think it's helpful to define it. So For me, a helpful definition is that racism is a combination of racist ideas and racist policies that produce and normalize racial inequities. And we already know, based on a lot of the data, that in this country, we see racial inequities in healthcare, we see racial inequities in education, and we certainly see racial inequities in our criminal justice system. If healthcare organizations are aiming to do the work to live out their mission of providing high quality care to their communities, we can't do that work without addressing racism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think some of the systems that you mentioned that have the existing inequities, education, these are systems that impact your health outcomes. We call those the social determinants of health. And another interesting point about how racism is connected to health is the concept of weathering that I think we should mention here. And that's the physical impact that chronic stress has on the body and chronic stress specifically coming from prejudice and racism. This is studied often in maternal health. And we see that the chromosomal markers of black women appear seven and a half years older than white women's chromosomal markers. Wow. And I appreciate the effort to actually name this and outline specifically the health outcomes that are caused by racism. And I think there's one in particular that's important for this moment, and that's actually police violence and police brutality. Yeah, police violence is certainly a public health issue. Researchers from the University of Michigan recently came out with some publications that have identified police use of force as the sixth leading cause of death for young black men. Hmm. And that number doesn't even cover the non-fatal instances of violence or the enduring trauma that lasts and exists across communities who have to face this again and again and again. 
And of course, this issue is coming to light right now because of the murder of George Floyd. It, it really felt like a tipping point for a lot of people. And of course, in response, we've seen protests, including right here in Washington, D.C., just erupt across the country. Michele, what do you make of the intensity of the protests? I think a lot of this, for sure, was set off by the egregious murder of George Floyd. But really, there's a lot of pent-up grief and anger about the countless Black people that have died in recent years and past decades across our history as a nation. Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor— Unfortunately, those are just a few of the people that we've seen die at the hands of police. And we know that it's not all just about individual acts of racism. It's not all about police brutality. It's also that we are living in a system that does perpetuate certain inequities. Yeah. And I think it's important in order to really understand the context here to understand that there are threats to Black life coming from all angles. And I'm talking about the existing health disparities that impact Black communities across virtually all conditions. So when I think about chronic conditions, asthma, diabetes, Black communities are more likely to face these. Black communities are also more likely to die of the conditions they do have, cancer and heart disease. I think about maternal health, which is something I study. And unfortunately, Black women are over three times more likely to die of a pregnancy-related death than white women. And this is no matter the socioeconomic status of the woman. A Black woman with a college degree is more likely to have a negative outcome than a white woman who never graduated high school. And all told, for exactly those reasons you mentioned, whether it's police violence, brutality, the effect on, on health disparities, that all leads to a pretty drastically different life expectancy when we look at Black Americans and their counterparts. Mm -hmm. Particularly in urban areas. In our hometown of Washington, D.C., there's a 15-year difference in life expectancy for white people versus Black people. And the question that that raises for me is, why are we okay with life expectancy for Black people being so much lower than their white counterparts? And I feel like that's a question that's really driving a lot of the anger that we're seeing in our country. How much do we have to deal with before someone says, this is not okay? It definitely points to a neurocognitive bias that a lot of us have, the fundamental attribution error, where we're more likely, if something goes wrong in our life, to blame it on external circumstances and not blame it on our internal character. But when we see other people struggling, we blame it on them and their character rather than the circumstances that they live in. And that's something that we have to call into question. Mm And of course, all of this is happening in the backdrop of a pandemic, which is most pronounced among marginalized groups. And Darby, the data you just referenced was all true prior to the pandemic. So I want you to take a moment and tell me about how COVID-19 is impacting people of color and Black people in particular. A lot of people, when thinking about who is most at risk for the coronavirus, think about elderly folks, people who live in nursing homes. And that is true. It's also true that people of color and Black people in particular, whether they live in a nursing home or not, are at elevated risk of death. So on average, Black Americans die from the new coronavirus at 2.4 times the rate of white Americans. This is just an illustration of how uncomfortable we are with addressing race and racism, that we know, based on the data, that Black Americans are disproportionately impacted, but it's hard for us to speak the truth about that. A lot of the national narrative has not focused on that enough. So let's do that now. Let's unpack some of the reasons why racism is impacting health disparities to this great extent, particularly in the middle of a pandemic. I think a short but complex answer to your question is structural racism. And this goes into the definition Michele introduced us to. One aspect of racism is the structural piece. And when we say that, we refer to the centuries of marginalization that has been baked into the systems and the institutions of our country. And these institutions have been controlled for the vast majority of our history by white people. 
And I'm talking about the media. I'm talking about education systems, the banking systems, the criminal justice systems, healthcare systems, and the police force. And choices and policies have been made across each of these institutions that perpetuate white privilege, as well as the oppression of people of color. Tell me about how some of that structural racism feeds into the day-to-day life for Black people, particularly in the face of a pandemic like COVID-19. Well, number one, as I mentioned, Black Americans are more likely to have the comorbidities that are really dangerous for coronavirus. They're also less likely to have access to the social goods that serve as protective measures. Think healthy food and stable housing. And third, they're also more likely to hold jobs that have been deemed essential, meaning they are less able to social distance. And these jobs include healthcare, transportation, food supply. Mm hmm. I want to note, too, though, that we have a responsibility to look at bias at the point of care. We know that there's also data that backs up that when a Black person goes in to get care, that they will experience a disparity in what the diagnosis is and the treatment recommendations and the amount of questions that their provider asks and what medications they get. So there's also a responsibility that clinicians have to address that beyond the structural, which I know can seem very difficult to tackle. Mm -hmm. And of course, all of this means that racism is, in fact, a healthcare issue. I'm curious, what can organizations do knowing that racism has an impact on health outcomes for their patients and their communities? First things first, an advisory board has certainly done a lot of work in this area, but you have to know where the inequities are. We've been talking a lot about Black communities. It may look different for you and your organization, but you can't address something if you don't know where the problem is. And then the second thing is, turn to your community. If you really want to do anti-racist work, there are organizations who are experts on this. Your health system is probably not the expert in communities of color. So turn to those organizations. Let them lead you to where they want your support. And you just used a term that I'm hearing a lot about right now, which is anti-racist. I'm curious, maybe Darby, can you help define what that term means? Yeah, it's a good question. So when we think about anti-racism, it's different than not being racist. And I think the difference is passivity versus action. So at this point, it's not enough just to not do a racist thing. But you actually actively have to be a part of dismantling the racist structures and calling out biased behaviors when you see it. And let's bring that to this moment in particular. What can healthcare leaders do to directly support the efforts of their community? Maybe particularly if they are in one of the communities that's seen a surge of protests right now. Healthcare organizations right now need to be a part of the conversation. Your community, your employees are looking for you to make an explicit stand against racism. If you do not, they are going to view your silence as complicity with all of the things that are happening in our society today. There are some healthcare organizations who have come out pretty actively against racism. What are some of those in particular? Well, notably, the AMA made a statement recently that specifically called out the need to end police brutality as a public health mandate and also embedded it within the historical context of American racism. So this is important because it's not that this is the third rail anymore. You can also be part of this conversation. And one thing I'll note as you are making statements is to not rely on your chief human resource officer or your chief diversity officer to be the one to make the statement. This should be coming from the CEO. And as a side note, we want to also say that we need white leaders to step up and say that they stand against racism. If the messages continue to just come from people of color, we won't be able to make progress here because we would have dismantled racism by now if that was the case. And I think it's really important to push all healthcare leaders to be an active part of the conversation. Like you said, Darby, it's not the third rail anymore. It's time to step in. I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit more about what leaders can do to actually improve things moving forward. Yeah. When I think about moves that provider organizations can make right now, number one, I think about supporting your patients who are choosing to protest. 
So what this looks like is making sure that they can make these choices safely. If you have extra PPE, masks, hand sanitizer, donate them to activist organizations who are organizing these protests. Some of your staff may be interested in participating. So sending clinical support on the front lines to help people who maybe have respiratory problems that have been exacerbated because of pepper spray, for instance. This is actually something that's really crucial for provider organizations to do to prevent the further spread of COVID in communities of color and specifically Black communities, which we know are most at risk. And I don't know about the two of you, but I'm certainly getting questions from executives right now who are not just asking about how they can support their community, but also how they can support their own people, right? Their own physicians and employees and staff. And, and Darby, you talked a little bit about an option as it relates to supporting protesters, but I'm curious, what else can leaders do to support their physicians, their employees, and their staff right now? That's incredibly important. We really don't want to be investing all this in the community and then not be doing the work internally for our own staff at a time when they're already pretty burned out from the pandemic. So a few things I would highlight would be, one, be courageous enough to have internal conversations about what is going on. I think the worst thing that we can do is ignore it and not create a space for people to either grieve if they need to grieve or to talk about what are the actions that we want to take as allies that are going to help us combat racism in our communities. Secondly, if you happen to have employee resource groups and you have one that's dedicated to people of color or to Black employees, ask them, what is the support that you need from us right now? Whether that's a day off or just freeing up some of their time so that they can focus on processing things emotionally. I would note, Please do not ask for those staff to be leaders of the solution in dismantling the racism that they face. That is a really tall order and is not their responsibility. And I'm very mindful of the fact that there is a spotlight on racial injustice right now. But I'm curious, what are some of the longer term steps that organizations can take to dismantle some of this structural racism, maybe even after the protests have stopped? There are a number of anti-racist actions that provider organizations have already been taking. The first one is providing the role of an anchor institution in your community. So when I say anchor institution, I'm referring to organizations that have realized that they are the major employer in their community and that they can take real steps, make real business decisions to uplift the economic outcomes that they see. So that looks like paying all of your staff a living wage, making sure you create career pathways for local students to enter your organization and also to help entry-level staff become clinical staff if they want to. It also looks like being really strategic about the business investments you're making and who you partner with for your supply chains and contracting with local women of color-owned businesses whenever possible. And also we're seeing a number of social impact loan efforts to support community-led investments. So that's the anchor role. Organizations can also play the advocate role. And this looks like using your traditional governmental or policies affairs arm, and instead of using it just for reimbursement rates, looking at how you can advocate for policies or legislation that impact the community health of your local area, and also looking at those that can impact health equity. I want to add more putting my workforce hat on, and that's investing in the leadership of people of color. I think a lot of times we don't see enough people of color leaders within healthcare organizations, and this is going to require us to look at our own internal policies around promotion, around how we evaluate talent, how we invest in talent, and whether or not we actually have succession management in place. It's a long road ahead, but so that over time we can see more representation in our senior leadership ranks. And I mentioned at the outset that we would be leaning into conversations that would be keeping executives up at night. And in an honest moment, I think there are a lot of leaders, in particular white leaders, which of course are are most of them, who are feeling uncomfortable right now. Michele, can you give some advice directly to them and help them avoid the ways that this could go potentially wrong? Yeah. You know, I think 
I am not a white person, so I can't imagine the discomfort um, of being white in this moment and not having all of the right words to talk about race and racism. But I think I can assure you that your employees, your community would rather you kind of be humble, be vulnerable and realize like you don't have all of the answers, but to hear you make a statement anyway. And I think in terms of your question about where this could go wrong, do not just send an email and expect that to be your action. That is the first step that you're taking in a series of actions to help address racism in your community, whether that's donating to local organizations that are doing anti-racist work, volunteering your time, educating yourself. There's a lot of other steps that you can take, and you should be vocal with your organization about some of the things that you're doing. And as a white person, maybe it's appropriate for me to offer some advice, which is we're going to make mistakes. This is not going to be easy for us. We don't know everything about this. So what we need to do is take the lens of cultural humility and understand that we're not going to have all the answers, but we're going to have this growth mindset. We're going to enter knowing that we are you know, not going to be perfect and we have to continuously reassess our intentions the impact of our work, and keep trying to be better. I think as leaders, we would be calling all of you to not prioritize your own comfort over Black lives. And also, the national attention is on this issue right now. What are you going to do when the national attention moves on to the next issue, to the next tragedy? Are you going to continue the work and are you going to hold the rest of the executive team and your senior leadership accountable to doing it on an ongoing basis? Well, Michelle Darby, I want to thank you so much for coming on Radio Advisory, particularly in kind of a tough moment with literally helicopters flying overhead here in Washington. I want to offer you each a couple of final moments to give some advice to the healthcare leaders right now, those ones that are wondering, what can I do? How do I know if I'm doing enough? Michelle, why don't we start with you? I would ask that we all question some misconceptions that we might have about what does it mean for me to be an inclusive leader? Because many of us have this belief that I'm not biased. I'm not racist. We don't want to be labeled that way because we feel like we're good people. We get defensive when people say that we're racist. We don't want people to perceive us as discriminatory. And the truth is, for the most part, I believe that we are all intending to be good people and that we're not intending to do harm to anyone. But if we're honest with ourselves, our intentions do not matter as much as the impact of our actions. And so realize that, you know, this belief that I'm not biased, I'm not racist is an excuse that we can hide behind. And when we do that, we're not taking responsibility for our actions. So to move past that, we need to accept that being biased does not make you a bad person. It means that you are a human. And what makes us great people is not about being right or being free of bias. It's having the humility to own that you are biased and to look for ways to interrupt those biases. Darby, what about you? I think my message would be that this is the time for white people to step up. As Michelle mentioned we're not going to end racism. We're not going to end police violence without white people standing in solidarity with people of color who are leading this movement. I think we have to say that Black Lives Matter explicitly. I think that we have to take a lot of time to educate ourselves, to read materials, really foundational materials that we'll share in the show notes. And I think it's time for us, once we feel equipped with an understanding of institutional racism, with an understanding of police violence, this is our time to bring our information and our knowledge to our communities, because we are the communities that need education. Ray, can I add one more thing? Go for it. If your mission as a healthcare organization is to deliver patient-centered, high-quality care, we cannot deliver on this mission unless we address racism. Well, Michelle Darby, thank you so much for having such an impactful conversation with us here on Radio Advisory. Please make sure that you're, you're staying safe out there. Thanks, Ray. Stay safe. Thank you. J. 
just like we're experiencing with COVID-19, there will be a long road ahead as our nation continues to respond to racial injustice. And I know that many of you are asking, what should I do? Know this, racism is a healthcare issue, and it's one that healthcare leaders cannot be silent on. It might feel uncomfortable, but every leader must take anti-racist actions, support their grieving community, and offer meaningful support to their employees. Even when the spotlight moves and the news cycle changes, the work doesn't go away. Caring for the people in your community and the patients you serve will require a focus on the health disparities that affect people of color, on the social determinants that impact long-term health, and on the instances of violence and police brutality that ultimately result in a shorter lifespan for so many Black people. This is hard work. But as always, we're here to help.